See, the Bible tells us that from the beginning of creation, we were created in God's image to reflect Him. There's a difference between what you do and who you are. And God made who you are way before you even had the opportunity to do anything. A lot of Christians know Jesus. A lot of Christians know scripture. A lot of Christians know spiritual practices. And it's possible that not everyone who claims the title of Christian is actively working on becoming like Jesus. All right, it's me, it's Kristen again. You're like, is that the same girl? Yes, this is summer humidity, Kristen. So same, same person. Listen, we are in a series kind of called Summer Solos, which means if you are not here every single week, it's okay because these messages are not necessarily connected. Pastor Naeem and Ashley and their family are on vacation this week. They might be on live stream. Hey guys. They are on vacation this week and we are giving Pastor Naeem a, a few weeks off this summer. And before you're like, oh man, listen, this is good. It's really a good thing. He gives so much to Mosaic. He pours so much into preparing his messages week after week that it's really good for him and Ashley both to be able to have the time to refresh and just be you know, poured into by God. This morning, however, get ready. I'm so glad y'all are lively and rowdy because we are gonna have some fun this morning. Will you help me welcome up my friend, Tiff Godwin from U City Church. <laughs> Well, good morning, yes. everyone. Keep that Let up. me Let's make sure go. I'm on here. Wow, I feel the energy. How are you guys doing? Yes, oh, I love it. Well, like Pastor Kristen just said, I am Tiffany Godwin. I'm one of the leaders over at a church that just launched in January called Lake Forest U City. We love to call it U City. Yes, we got some of our U Cityans here in the building. That's so exciting. Listen, we just wanna say we absolutely love your leaders. Like all of them, every single one, I feel like is my family. I feel like is my uncle, my cousin, my sister. Like I so love them from the top down. I mean, literally, Pastor Naeem, Pastor um, Ashley, Kristen, Sean, Mike, like we love them so much. You guys have the best leaders. They have absolutely been there for us throughout this time because we've got to be a little bit crazy to say yes to launching a church, okay? And so they have been there to support, to speak life into us, to cheer us on and move us on. And so we are just so thankful for them. Can we give it up? for your leaders. We love y'all. And hey, listen, I've, I've got a question for you guys today, though. Um, have you ever been in a season of your life where you're like, whoa, like, what is this? What's happening here? Like, you felt like before, like, your whole life felt great. It didn't maybe feel perfect, but it felt like it made sense, right? And now maybe some of you are right here right now. Some of you may have just gotten out of it or are going into a season where you feel like, I don't know how this fits. I don't know why I'm living through this or why God is allowing me to go through this. Anybody been there? Yeah, yeah? okay, we got some yes. Well, hey, I've absolutely been there and we're gonna talk about that today, but you know, before I get all up in your living room, <laughs> let's get acquainted, okay? So, like I said, I'm Tiffany, I am 30 years old. I grew up right here in Charlotte, North Carolina, right down the street, okay? I attended and graduated from Mallard Creek High School, which I know you all used to meet there, right? So we've got ties. We were connected before we even knew, okay? No, but I, I graduated from Mallard Creek. I also am a beloved Enneagram 7, you guys. Anybody know anything about the Enneagram? There we go. Amen. So I'm an Enneagram 7. For those of you who don't know what that is, personality test categorized by one through nine numbers. I am number seven. We're the ones who are kind of crazy kind of a ping pong ball, kind of spontaneous all over the place. We love to have fun. We don't really like pain. And we just love to just do a whole bunch of stuff, y'all, right? And so that's me. I love doing a whole bunch of stuff. And I love putting things together, both literally and figuratively. My dad will tell you and attest to this. He's here today that he and I, he's always got me putting together some furniture or something, y'all. <laughs> Always, okay? So yes, when I say I like putting furniture together, I'm even talking about Ikea furniture, y'all. That comes with those, the, 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 you know, the instructions, you're like, what is this? Like, no words? Like, what is this, right? <laughs> like, I love doing that too. And then I love, like, literally putting anything together strategically, right? My brain is always, like, strategizing. What's going on here? What's happening? How can I fix this or put this together, right? But there is one thing, y'all. 
one thing that I don't necessarily love putting together. I just can't find the joy in it. And if some of you are in here who love this, it's okay. It's all good. I'm not judging you at all, okay? And that thing is puzzles. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I said I'm a seven, so if I'm going to spend some time putting something together, man, it's got to be functional when I am finished. <laughs> Some of you are like, it is functional. It's a, piece of, it's, it's a pretty picture. I can hang it up. And I'm like, no, no, I can buy the picture without putting it together, OK? So some of you love this kind of stuff, right? But listen, it's, it's not my thing, never been my thing, not really into it, not approved by me, OK? And so listen, there was this one winter holiday season. My grandmother's like, like into these puzzles, and I'm spending some time with her. And so I go to her house, we've been out all day, we get back, and she's like, hey Tiff, come over here and help me put my puzzle together. And I'm like, ma'am, this is a thousand pieces, you've only got 10 done, what do you mean? <laughs> right? So I'm like, uh, but it's my grandma, so you have to say yes, right? So I sit down at the table, I'm across from her, and I'm like, all right grandma, let's do it, you know? So we're starting to put this puzzle together. I sit down, I pick up a piece, right? Pick up just one piece, and I'm like, I'm not even gonna look at the box, like I'm just gonna try to figure out where it goes. That is pride, guys. Do not do that. And so I pick it up, and my grandma's got the box, the top of the box, right? She's got it faced towards her. So I'm literally, like, on this side, trying to figure it out, like, uh, I think it fits here. I think it fits, like, no clue, right? So I'm struggling. I'm getting frustrated. I'm getting stuck because I'm holding this piece, and I cannot tell where it fits. And I'm like, well, I know that it has to, but I just don't know how. So then I say, well, forget this. This piece, we're not, we're not dealing with you right now. We'll go to another piece, right? So I pick up another piece, thinking like, oh, this will be better. OK. So I pick up this piece. I'm trying to put it in the puzzle. And again, I go through that same cycle. I get stuck trying to figure out where it fits. I get stuck trying to figure out what's its importance. What is this picture even supposed to be? And I could have just asked her to turn the box around, right, or just get up and go and look at the picture on top of the box. But instead, I decide, like, no, this is the view that I want. This is the view that I want, just one piece of the puzzle. And here's the thing. Like I said, I knew that if it was in this box, that it was supposed to be a part of this puzzle. I just couldn't figure out how, right? So how many of you feel like that in your life, though? Like this season, you're stuck focusing on it. You can't see the bigger picture, but you're like, it's supposed to be a part of this picture, but I cannot see it. And it's difficult for us to see the bigger picture that God is creating of our lives, right? Because he's got these thoughts and these ways that are so much higher than ours. And we're like, well, I'm going to just focus right here. This has got to make sense, right? And then we realize we get stuck. We're struggling. We're like, what does this mean, right? Like, we literally take this whole box of pieces, and we look at our lives, and we think they're just like this box. And we're like, okay, we look inside, and we see a bunch of broken pieces. We see a bunch of broken pieces that don't seem like they would fit together. Like, how in the world could anyone put these pieces together? But God, he sees this box, and he sees an already perfectly put together picture. He sees what he's already created in you, he's created you to do, and he, who he's created you to be. And guess what? He's piecing every, he's using every single piece of this puzzle. Because listen, like I said, if I knew that a piece was in the box of the puzzle, that it was supposed to be a part of the picture of the puzzle, if God is allowing you to go through something, if God is allowing you to experience something, then it is absolutely a part of his perfect plan for you, even if that's hard for you to understand and grasp today. Amen. And he's with you, all right? Now, some of you hear me say that, and you're like, okay, yeah, cool. That sounds great. So we're going to look in scripture, though, and see how this plays out in one person's story. We have the privilege of seeing this person's like different puzzle pieces of his life, and we see how God takes them and, and puts them together and fits them perfectly, even while he's living through them. And he's like, I don't get it. I don't understand it. And that person's name is Joseph. Anybody know about Joseph in the room? Yeah. And it's okay if you don't, because guess what? We're about to walk through his story, okay? You came to the right place today. And so a little bit about Joseph, though. He is Jacob's 11th of 12 sons, and he was born to uh, Jacob's wife, Rachel. Now, if any of you know anything about this or don't, it's all good, because Rachel, I'm telling you, Rachel uh, and Leah, Leah is Rachel's sister, they were both married to Jacob. But Rachel was barren. 
she couldn't have children for a long time of her marriage and of her life. So she's got to see Leah having kids. She's got to see her servants having kids, right? Like all 10 kids before she gets to have one. And the word tells us that God remembered her. And not in a way of like God forgot who she was or forgot about her or left her to the side. It's more so he remembered what he promised her and he remembered that it was time to allow her to experience that, right? And so God has not forgotten about you either, okay? And so Rachel has this kid, she has Joseph, and Jacob is a little bit older, and so the word tells us that Joseph is his favorite son. Now I know what some of you parents are in here thinking, like, oh, I would never choose a favorite kid. You're not telling the truth, and it's all good. But listen, there are some of you in here who are like, you're on that side. But then there are some of you in here who are like, I would absolutely tell you who my favorite kid is, right? Yeah, see, I hear some of you. God bless your children's hearts. So, <laughs> so, there, so Joseph, um, he is his favorite son, and Jacob goes so far as to not just tell people that he's the favorite. He makes this man a robe of many colors. And when I think of that, like when you think of that, I hope you don't think of like a robe of like, plain colors, like black and white. No, 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 no. Let's think of the rainbow. Just a whole bunch of colors. You can see it when it's coming. You know that this guy, somebody really, really loves him, right? And the other sons didn't have this robe. So of course, they're looking at him with this robe, and they're like, well, whoa, wait a minute, right? And they're upset, and they're annoyed, and they're frustrated because they are not the favorite. And it's that the word tells us that they could not speak peacefully to him, meaning they were always rude to their brother, always messing with him and bullying him and all the things that you could think of, right? So we're going to pick up in his story, if you guys could meet me in Genesis. And now before we dig in, we are about to take his story and break it up into puzzle pieces, right? So we're going to break it up into like five different puzzle pieces that all have real significance here. And there are pieces that I think that you all are going to be able to relate to at least one of today. So I would love for you to listen intently into all these pieces, what they mean, how they look, what God is trying to teach us about him. And we're going to point out a challenge that Joseph faced and that we might face and have as we are facing this season of our lives, okay? So everybody say five. five. There we go. Say five. five. We've got five different pieces. And this first piece we're going to call the dream. It's called the dream, okay? And so we're going to pick up in Genesis 37, verse 5 through 11, if you guys can meet me there. And so I'm reading from the ESV, verse 5, it says, Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were, be we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf rose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now, let me just pause right here because here's the deal with, Je with our friend Joseph, okay? If you know that someone does not really like you, if someone's not really your friend, are you going and just telling your dreams to them? Okay, so Joseph, I don't know, just put a pin in that, okay? So verse 9 says, Then he dreamed another dream. He didn't stop at one. And he told, and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he to told it to his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you. And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Okay, so this puzzle piece of the dream. This is the one where like, you feel like God is just giving you this insight into your life. He's just told you what, what he's about to do with you and in your life and through your life. And he's like, you're, you've got vision. Like you are living, you are loving life. You're on top of the world. Well, here is your challenge. And the challenge that Joseph faced, and he did not pass it, guys. But this is the challenge he faced. Don't rush it and don't boast about it just yet. Don't rush it and don't boast about it just yet. You can absolutely believe in it, right? You can absolutely say, I know that this is what God has told me. Be confident in it. Be confident in who God is. 
but don't rush and tell people about it like this soon, especially not people who don't like you, right? But also, just don't boast about it, because this is not by your doing that you're experiencing this dream, right? And what we learn about God in this season is that he absolutely does want to give us insight into what he's going to do in our lives, but he is a God of the process. I know some of you absolutely know that right now, that he will tell you something, he will tell you a dream, he will tell you a vision, but then there's going to be this time of a process that he's going to take you through to do whatever he's got to do in your life and in the lives around you in order to let your dream be fulfilled later on, right? So that is the dream. Now we, move, we keep moving forward, and the next puzzle piece we're going to call the pit. Everybody say the pit. The pit. There we go. So now Joseph uh, was, Jacob liked to keep him kind of away from his brothers because he's the favorite, right? So he's trying to protect him. And so there's this one day, though, that Jacob sends Joseph to go to where his brothers are supposed to be uh, um, taking care of their flock, right? And so he tells him, hey, go and see if your brothers are, one, doing what I told them they're supposed to be doing, but then also just let me know how they're doing, right? And so he goes, Joseph, goes to find them. And how about that, y'all? They are not where they are supposed to be. And so a man tells him, hey, they, they're not here. They've gone down to Dotham, right? So he goes down to Dotham because he's like, well, I'm going to go and see what they're doing. And he goes and, and finds them. But before he gets to them, they see him coming. And they devise a plan to kill Joseph. His brothers devise a plan to kill him. They hated him that much. And so they're like, okay, we're going to let wolves take him. And then we're just going to send his pretty little robe back to our dad. And we're going to tell him, like, we don't know what happened, right? And so um, one of the brothers Thank God for Reuben, the oldest. He speaks up. And he says this in verse 21 of chapter 37. He says, But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to their fa his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Uh, the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And so the pit season. This is the season where you feel like everybody has, is stacked up against you, has come against you. You feel like God has forgotten about you, right? You feel like you're at your bottom, and you're like, what is going on here? Why am I having to live through this? And the challenge that I want to pose to you is this, but before I tell you it, I want to say that your feelings are valid. Your season might really very well be a horrible one, and one that you were just like, this is the worst thing ever. How in the world, again, could I be living through this, right? Your challenge that I want to, uh, that I want to pose to you and the one that Jacob, or Joseph faced is to attempt to shift your perspective and say, I trust what God is doing. I trust that he knows what he's doing. I trust that he's in control. So you're shifting to trust. And then what we learn about God here is that he is a protector and that he is always on your side. Because here's the deal, y'all. I just told you that his brothers had devised a plan to kill him. So they were trying to end his life. They were trying to end this little dream he had. They were trying to end all these things. And yet Reuben, throwing him into the pit, is what saved his life. That's what saved him and allowed him to go on to see what we're going to see in the rest of his story. And so if we would just trust that God knows what he is doing, we'd see how all these pieces are about to come together. Because, again, God is a protector. He's on your side. And even when you feel yourself in the middle of a pit, at the bottom of a pit, he's still at work. He is still at work. And so bro Joseph's brothers end up actually taking him out of this pit, but then they sell him into slavery. So it's like, whoa, like, wait a minute. I know you guys are like, wait a minute, girl. I thought we were getting, going up here. What's going on? So Joseph's brothers, they end up, they take him out of this pit, sell him into slavery, and he is taken down to Egypt. Now, here's a little side note, you guys. Like, God will always get you to where he needs you to be. 
no matter what. No matter the circumstances, he'll take you on a roundabout. It'll feel like a detour. It'll feel like it does not make sense. But God will always get you to where you need to be because Joseph, we will find out later, was absolutely needed in Egypt. And so he's get, he gets taken down to Egypt, and he is sold to Potiphar, who is the captain of the guard of Pharaoh, of the king of Egypt. And Potiphar recognizes that God is with Joseph. Now, these are Egyptians, so they, like, um, recognize, like, many guys. They recognize, like, sorcerers and magicians and all these things. But he recognizes, like, wait a minute, there's something different about you here. And because of that, he places him as the overseer of his whole, of everything that he, he owns, his house, his possessions, and everything. And he allows him um, to, yeah, he allows him to be over all these things. And everything that's in his house is blessed. Everything in Potiphar's house is blessed, and he recognizes because of Joseph. So now this puzzle piece number three here that we're stepping into, you guys, is called the palace. He is in the palace now. And so as Joseph is uh, serving here, okay, here comes another little bit of a downer, I'm sorry, (laughs) is that Potiphar's wife tries to wrap Joseph up in an entanglement, Okay. Yes, an entanglement. Now, some of you are like, what's an entanglement? It's all good. I got you. I know I said I was 30. I know. I'm a little young. So an entanglement, in, uh, to make it uh, layman's terms here, is she was trying to have an affair with Joseph. Okay. And Joseph continually says no, continually, continually runs away, and continues to remain true to who he knows that he is supposed to be and he's called to be and what he's called to do in this house. And so... He remains pure. And so this palace, the season could, for you could feel like, okay, now we've made it. Now we've made it. I'm back on top of the world a bit, but there's still this like opposition. Like there's still this tension. There's still something here that's like, why am I experiencing this if I feel like I, am, I have made it again, right? Like what in the world is going on here? This feels great, but also there's like this little twinge of something happening. The challenge that Joseph faced and passed this time, y'all, give it up for my guy, he passed. He stewarded the blessing well. He stewarded this blessing that he was given well. And I think this is important for us to, to, uh, to see here because Joseph could have thought that this was the fulfillment of the dream that God had given him early on in his story, right? Like he could have thought like, oh, this is what he meant by I will rule. This is how, what he meant by my sheaves are gonna be taller and higher, right? But all in all, his story, as we go on, we're gonna see that the, the dream actually is fulfilled. So this is just like a dream before the dream, a blessing before the dream. And here's the thing, God has more for him. And God has more for you. So if you're standing in the middle of this season, you're like, things are great, but something's, something's off, God still has more for you. I know that here you guys say that um, he, we, we now into him who can do immeasurably more than we ask, think, or imagine. If you truly believe that, I say steward this blessing wherever you are well, because God has more for you than you can even think, ask, or imagine. And I think that he just allows us to be kind of tested I think he allows it to see what's in our heart, to see how we're doing in this season. And that's what happened here. And so now we've, we've made it, you guys, to the next puzzle piece. Everybody say number four. I'm sorry, we're going down again, okay? So <laughs> Potiphar's wife actually does end up accusing Joseph of, um, of having an affair with him, with her. And Joseph is sent to prison because Potiphar's like, well, I can't listen to a slave over my wife. Like, that's not, that's embarrassment. I can't do that. And so he does. He listens to his wife, sends Joseph to prison. And when Joseph is sent to prison, he gets there and is able to be, again, it's recognized that God is with him. That's That's a huge thing. He's recognized that God is with him. And he is placed as technically overseer of all the prison, of the prisoners, of everything that goes in and goes on in the prison. And so there's this one day that he sees a cupbearer and a baker, who used to be Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker. And he sees them with their faces like downcast. And he's like, wait, what's going on here? 
right? And of course, you might be thinking, well, aren't all their faces downcast in prison? But no, there was something interesting about Joseph being able to recognize their faces in this one, right? And so he sees that their faces are downcast. He's like, what's going on here? Why are you guys upset? What's going, what's wrong? And they tell him that they have had dreams that they cannot interpret. They don't understand. So here we can already see how pieces of this puzzle are coming together. Where Joseph had dreamed and he was able to interpret his own dreams. And now he's being taken to this space where he is able to interpret the dreams of others. And so he, so he tells them, hey, you guys tell me the dream. I'll interpret it for you and let you know what this means so it won't trouble you as much as it is right now, right? So he interprets them, and he interprets them correctly, we find out. But before they leave the prison, because he says that you two are going to be taken back up to Pharaoh, one of you is going to die, one of you is going to live, okay? And then, so he sends them up, or before they leave, he says, make sure you don't forget about me. Tell Pharaoh about me. Tell him I told you guys this correctly and who I am, right? And so they go, and guess what? They forget about him. So that, that just happened. I'm sorry. So they go and forget about him. And so in this season, though, this season of the prison, what could you be feeling? You would be feeling like, okay, th- what's going on? Because I was just in a pit not too, too long ago. And then I thought I had made it. And now I'm right back down here. Lord, what are you doing? Like, what is going on? You feel like, there, no, I'm not supposed to be here. This is, I, I, don't, I don't believe that this is a part of my story. And so you absolutely despise where you are. You're finding everything wrong about where you are. The challenge here is to continue to use your gift. Like, don't harbor your gift. Don't harbor who you are. And your gift could literally just be being who you are, your personality. So don't stop being who you are. Don't stop using the gift that God has given you and placed inside of you just because you don't like where you are. Because what we learn about God here, where we see Joseph interpret these dreams correctly, is that no matter where he has you, he will still use you, and your gift is needed there. There's a reason you were placed there, even if you can't see it. So continue to trust and continue to use your gift. Okay, y'all. We're up on the up and up again, guys. We are at puzzle piece number... There we go, number five, okay? So we've made it to number five, and this one we are calling the redemption. Joseph has finally made it, y'all, okay? And you have finally listened to a a good chunk of a Bible story. So so the redemption. So the cupbearer, like I said, initially had forgotten about Joseph, and he doesn't tell, tell Pharaoh about him. But then Pharaoh has these dreams, and this is after like two years. So I'm saying it like it's like, oh, two days, 10 days later. No, two years, okay? And Pharaoh has these dreams, and he's being tortured by these dreams that he's having over and over and over. And he's like, what do these mean? So he reaches out to his sorcerers, to his magicians, to his gods, and he's like, one of you has got to tell me what is going on here, right? And guess what? None of them could tell him. He's like, no. Every time they're trying to tell him, he's like, no, that doesn't, that's not it. And so finally, the cupbearer tells Pharaoh, Oh, I do know someone from prison who interpreted my dreams correctly and the dreams of a baker here, and they came true because the baker is no longer with us, but I'm standing right here in front of you. And so he gives Pharaoh not only the interpretation that there's going to be seven years of abundance that they're going to experience, it's going to be up and up, but then there's going to be seven years of a famine. And he tells him, this is what's going to happen, but I'm going to also give you the strategy that you need. God has given it to me to tell you. The strategy that you need in order for us to survive this and not see this destruction and this and death that could come from the famine. And so he tells him, you should appoint somebody to, do, to be over this, to handle this, right? And so in chapter 41, verse 38, we see this. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this? In whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Hmm, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. Y'all, here is where his dream 
has finally come to fruition. Here is where these puzzle pieces have finally started to connect. So in this season, you feel like, oh man, now we've actually for real made it. I don't, I'm not looking, peeking around the corner like, what's the next pit or the next prison? Like you feel like, okay, my dream has been realized. And you are standing right in the middle of your promise. Now here's your challenge though. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget all these pieces that came together to get you here. All these pieces that came together that God used to get you right here. Because what we learn about God is that his word never returns to him void, meaning what he speaks is actually what's going to be. And if he's spoken something over your life, if he said this is your dream, this is the vision that I have for your life, that is going to be the thing that you see. So remember where you came from. I was watching the movie Joseph, King of Dreams. Yes, the animated movie, guys. I was watching this, and in a part of the movie at the very end, Joseph thinks back, and you see him thinking back to all these different pieces. He thinks back to when he was hated by his brothers. He thinks back to when they threw him in the pit. He thinks back to when he was in the palace, all these things. And then it's almost like he's, he just comes to, comes to focus, and he's like, wait a minute. Now I understand. Because I think what our question is as we go through all these different puzzle pieces is, how do I make it through this? Like, how did Joseph make it through all these pieces of the puzzle? And I think what we see here is that Joseph remembered, one, that God was with him. He had not left him. He had not forgotten about him. He had not forsaken him. And the whole entire time, he was taking all these pieces, all the pieces of Joseph's life, and he was putting them together perfectly, putting them exactly in the spot where they were supposed to to be. And so I don't know exactly where you guys are in your life with this, but I want you to know that God is using every single piece of your life. Every single piece of the puzzle of your life, God is using it. He's not, he's not picking up pieces like I was and throwing them out and saying, we'll deal with that later. No, no, he was picking up pieces and saying, I know exactly where this piece goes and where this piece goes and where this piece goes. And he's using them for his glory. He's creating a picture and for your good. He doesn't want us to live through the prison and the pit forever, right? Like he wants to show us that he's with us even through those times. And there's a verse that I love that is very common. It says, it's in Romans 8 and 28. And it says, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. What I love about this verse is it doesn't doesn't say, and we know that some of the things will work together for the good. It doesn't say that, oh, a few of the parts of my life will work together for my good. No, no, no. It says, and all things work together for the good of those who love God. I feel like some of you need to be reminded of that. Can we just say all things? Come on, one more time. Say, all things, things. yes, work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He is using every single piece of the puzzle, and we saw that in Joseph's life because here's the deal, y'all. If Joseph had never been the favorite of his father Jacob, then he would have never been hated by his brothers, right? And if his brothers had never hated him, they would have never thrown him into the pit. And if they had never thrown him into the pit, then it would have never sold him into slavery and him sent to Egypt, right? Then if he was never sent to Egypt and sold into slavery and and living in Potiphar's house, then his Potiphar's wife would have never been able to falsely accuse him. And if she had never falsely accused him, he would have never went to prison. And had he never gone to prison, he wouldn't have been able to interpret the dreams of the cupbearer and the chief baker. And had he never interpreted their dreams properly and correctly, then they would have never been able to tell Pharaoh, hey, I know somebody that you need back here, right? And then if they had never been able to do that, right, if Pharaoh had never called him up, then he would have never been able to interpret Pharaoh's dreams properly and correctly. And then if he had never been able to interpret his dreams, Pharaoh would have never placed him second in command. And if he had never placed him second in command, then he would have never seen his dream realized. He would have never seen it realized. 
And so what I didn't touch on is that Joseph, this is not the end. There are even more pieces that I really encourage you guys to go and read because he eventually saves his family from this, y'all. Those who he had just been, he felt like he was despised by, he felt like he was forgotten about by, he ends up going and being able to save them and forgive them. Oh my, he's able to forgive them through all that they just went through. And so again, I don't know where you are in your life. You might feel like you're facing a 300 piece puzzle in your life right now. Maybe it's a 500 piece puzzle. You feel like you just, it just keeps getting like more and more broken pieces. And now at the beginning, I told you that when I pick up a piece of this puzzle, I get frustrated because I don't know where it goes. I have no clue what I'm supposed to do with this piece. But when God picks up these pieces, he turns the box around and he's able to see the entire picture and place these things. He's already placed it. He's already created this picture. And guys, if this piece of the puzzle is in this box, then it's supposed to go in this puzzle, right? And if you are experiencing a part or a moment in your life or a season of your life, then it is absolutely supposed to be a part of God's perfect plan for you. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, let me pray for us. Hey, Father, you are so, so good. We are so thankful for you and thankful for this moment and this time. Thank you for being the God who is omniscient, who knows everything about us, everything about our lives, who literally numbered our days and knows everything that we're supposed to go through. And you did it for your glory and for our good. God, I pray over the hearts that are in this room today who are having a hard time believing that. I pray that you would just soften the heart and you would open the eyes. God, this week, right now, I pray that you would open it up so that they would be able to see you clearly and see what you were doing clearly and to trust you. God, increase our faith today in what you say and who you are. You're good. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.